Hey, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Get Stuff Done podcast. I'm Bonnie Campo. With me is Chief Operating Officer Stephen Harp. Thank you. Good to be here. We also have the Secretary of Environment and Energy, Ken Wagner. How are you, Ken? I'm doing well. Thanks. So, guys, today we're going to be taking a deeper look at energy in the state. And, Steve, I think you really want to kick this one off. So, first of all, uh, it's special for me to be here, uh, Secretary Wagner. This will probably be the last one of these I do, so I want to make sure I came for this one. So, um, I think energy is, in, in, in Ken's world, I think that segment understands it, but I don't know if most Oklahomans do. So are there some cool factoids you can lay on us about energy and our consumption or our production of energy you think Oklahomans should know? Well, I think, I think you know, energy and uh, the environmental com- uh, components of energy are really at the forefront. We see the infrastructure package uh, being voted upon today and, and significant climate bills. Um, I think the thing that I most like people to understand is that when it comes to the climate perspective on energy, that Oklahoma is really a national leader, and we don't get credit for it. We, we, we get perceived um, as only a state that can do traditional fossil energy, oil and gas. And while that is a significant part of our story today, uh, in the past, and certainly in the future, it's not the only part of it. And uh, most people are surprised to, to know that Oklahoma is one of only four states to get more than 40% of its power met by renewables. I actually read about this when we were looking at the hydrogen task force. So can you talk about your role in that, where it's going, where you'd like it to go? Sure, sure. But I think I think one more component that I think is really part and parcel of not just the 40, almost 50% renewables is that we, because of our natural gas component, which natural gas is 70% cleaner than coal when it's used for power generation, that we've reduced our carbon dioxide since 2005 at three times the national average. Wow. So the 2005 benchmark is the benchmark that President Biden's using for his ambitious 2030 goals. People ask me, when are we going to set our goals for 2030? And, and when are we going to beat that that number? And I'm going to say, I don't know, last week. <laughs> so I mean, we've we've really, you know, the the, the benchmark is 50% reduction from the 2005, um, the 2005 in, in CO2 levels. And we're already at 36% reduction. So we've only got to go 14 more percent. And I think that's a 2018 number. EIA doesn't keep up quite as Mm -hmm. it's not real time. And so I think when the 2020 numbers actually come out, uh, that we're going to be very dangerously close uh, to to that. And there's some retirement of some coal plants that will get us over the edge. And so we're going to have no problem meeting the, the, the 2030 benchmarks. That's awesome. It is cool. So in terms of like, as the average Oklahoman, you know, you, you don't see what that looks like unless you're driving up by Enid or driving down by Davis. You know, you see all the wind farms. Talk a little bit about maybe the future of that or our investment in that technology or how that plays into that 40 percent. Well, so o- Oklahoma is part of the Southwest Power Pool. And so when you think of our grid, it's not just uh, wind. It's not just solar. It's not just natural gas. Uh, it's not just coal. Uh, it's all of it together. And, and we really don't we, we set up the environment for people to invest in Oklahoma. And because of our rich richness in resources, both abundance of natural gas and the fact that we have um, some space and, and the wind blows on that space and the sun shines on this state, <laughs> we, we are perfectly suited for um, a lot of those resources to come to our state. And so um, the other thing that we're so proud of is that while we're also the cleanest energy in the country, we're also the most affordable. And that's because uh, we do utilize our resources in a way that that maximizes those and doesn't rely on um, pencil necks in Washington, D.C., <laughs> searching for the right word, people in Washington, D.C. telling us how to do it. We, we do it better than anybody else, and it's because we know our resources, we've got an abundance of it, and we care about our environment too. Are you finding, you know, so obviously we've been known as an oil and gas state for so long, but are you finding that we're able to balance all of these different energy sectors within, um, you know, what we're, in terms of the energy that we're actually producing? In other words, are people getting upset that we're investing in other areas? In other words, we haven't lost or diminished our investment in oil and gas. No, we're still, so, so you know, I mean, <clears throat> policymakers like to think that they control how oil and gas is produced or utilized. 
Uh, but, but really, it's something called demand, right? I mean, we still need to drive our cars. We still need to fuel our cars up. We have multiple, every product you can think of is components made from natural, uh, from, from, uh, natural gas liquids. Uh, that are produced in abundance here in the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, and natural gas is, you know, we, we refuse to cede the idea that natural gas is not clean energy. Um, it's, it's none of these sources, whether it's, uh, you know, wind, solar, uh, natural gas, oil and gas, uh, for vehicles, batteries, each one has an environmental footprint. And you have to look at it from cradle to grave, in from from what the mining of, of a resource is to the waste streams that come from it. In, and each has its own environmental footprint. And so it's none of those sources in and of themselves are evil. It's the emissions and the mm. waste streams that we don't like. And so what we need to do is really focus on minimizing those and then utilizing it in a way that best uh, supports Oklahomans, and that's what I think we're seeing doing, mm-hmm. uh, happening here. No longer do we see oil and gas guys, you know, um, and and renewables fighting tooth and nail. It's how can we grow Oklahoma and create more demand for all of us and for all our, of our resources. And that's really what the governor I think has been focused on is how do we use our energy portfolio to create an environment where we can have more jobs. And can, whenever we talk about both of those things succeeding, I think recently we saw that active wells are up, but at the same time you are expanding those renewables. So that's how we see them existing together. Right. So so, um, uh, we're about to publish our uh, energy uh, plan that hasn't been updated since 2011. So we're quite excited about it. Uh, And in that we state, look, we're not about setting numeric goals, because if we had set those goals, we've, we've already exceeded them. And so for us, it's about being nimble. Technology is moving at a very rapid pace, and we want to be able to react. Hydrogen is a great example of that. We want to be able to, to react in a way that allows us to capitalize on our, our leadership in energy generally and adopt those technologies. I mean, there's so many factors that make Oklahoma uh, a perfect state to be a leader internationally in energy and, and certainly nationally. And that's number one, we're at the crossroads of America. We have uh, the, the, the one of the best interstate systems mm-hmm. that crosses here, uh, right here in Oklahoma City. Uh, we have right in Cushing, Oklahoma, we have the crossroads of America for pipelines. Uh, we have uh, you know, w- abundance of wind and abundance of sun. Uh, we have space. We have gr- good transmission. We have a workforce that's ready-made for these sorts of things. Uh, we know how to deal with storing underground liquids like uh, like natural gas and 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 oil and uh, using injection wells. So we're perfectly suited for things like carbon capture and hydrogen. And uh, we're excited about how hydrogen is that one renewable resource that can unite both uh, the renewable sector and the fossil traditional fossil energy. There's a, a place for both to really play well in that space. So, so talk a little bit. Let's go back to February. Um, that was a tough time for Oklahomans. Big cold snap created a, a problem for producers as well as for consumers. I'm not sure everyone understands like that that problem set but i also want to focus some time on i mean you've been heavily involved in that to make sure that we try to keep um prices down not just for state government for consumers as well so they weren't hit with these massive bills kind of talk through what that was and maybe a little bit of what you and your cabinet went through right and when you well, say february you're referencing that great cold snap that yeah. everyone felt and then the southwest power pool and how we played into that right yeah that's exactly right, right. and and i think um, setting the stage quickly um, to, to give you guys a, a general idea of what the scope of the problem was. Texas, uh, I just read an article that they, their final death toll is 210 people wow. uh, that died as a direct result of lack of power for cold. Wow. And that the, the, the cost of that storm was over $100 billion. And so... Uh, that makes it the largest single natural disaster in the history of Texas, and that includes Hurricane Harvey and some uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, those types of things. So to to put a scope on it, so we fared very well. You know, they had ten days of people without power. 
uh, many of the many of whom were out without power the entire time. Many were without power for four or five days. Oklahoma, as part of the Southwest Power Pool, experienced the first controlled outages, uh, shedding load, blackouts, whatever you want to call it. We we incurred that for the first time in our history. So the Southwest Power Pool had never. So as a grid, um, there were only 240 minutes in which an Oklahoman might have experienced a controlled outage. And the longest of those should have been two hours. Uh, and so we can state with relative certainty that nobody as a result of those uh, direct outages uh, during that 240 minute period experienced significant property loss or loss of life. Now certainly people experienced loss because they didn't winterize their homes properly or didn't right, know sure. how to deal with the storm. Right. But it wasn't because they lacked power. Explain to people why we had to take those kind of measures or why the producers did to take 240 minute outages. What, what was at risk? So, so, you know, when you think of your power mix, you know, it's seamless to us. And what the Southwest Power Pool does is they look at their 14 state footprint and they say, what resources do we have available? And they look for the most reliable and the most affordable or the least cost, and they direct those to generate. And Oklahoma is always the least cost provider amongst the states. So we're the most affordable and we actually generate about 30% more power than we use. So we send our clean energy to our neighbors uh, where they can uh, take advantage of our good, good, uh, good neighborliness and, 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 and low cost. And it goes all the way up to North Dakota, it do, right? It so does, you have and a, actually into Montana. Right. So a, a, a part of the panhandle of Texas up all the way to North Dakota and Montana. And so what, when you think about it, it's just a big pie chart, right? So at, at, at any given day, on a normal day in Oklahoma, you're going to have about 40, 40% wind and about 45% natural gas. And coal is usually going to be chugging along in the single digits somewhere with, mi my, with miscellaneous sources elsewhere. We're always, you know, between 3 and 6% on hydroelectric power, assuming no drought. We've had abundance of water the last four years so we we see a lot of that and what happened in the the winter storm is um, wind and solar do what renewables do they're intermittent in their nature and so uh, if if the wind if they're not winterized properly they can get ice those blades get imbalanced and it can can ruin the windmill and become dangerous so they shut them down uh, another thing is that that many times the wind just doesn't blow enough to generate power uh, and certainly, you know, solar panels can be iced. Uh, you know, they, they now have some bifacial where the if, if, if it's snow covered on top, they'll reflect on the bottom and you can generate that way. But, but the traditional sense is that they are curtailed. Yeah. Uh, and then normally in Oklahoma, natural gas is able to fill that gap because it's very dispatchable. It's at low, as low or lower cost as the renewable. And you can generate quickly. You can you, you don't have to have a 12-hour warm-up period to fire up a, a gas turbine. And so uh, that's normally how we fix it. But in this storm, because um, it was just unprecedented 10 days of sub sub-zero weather, uh, we experienced you know when you when you produce oil and gas, a lot of water comes up in the process. That water freezes and it makes it imp impossible to, to actually produce. And uh, in North Dakota, places like that, they put heaters and there's a cost to that, right? It costs a little bit more money, but you know you're going to need it. Here, I mean, this is a once in a generation. Sure. Now, so do we plan for that in the future? Maybe. Uh, but so natural gas was about 27%. And on the day that we actually had outages, um, renewables were about 10%. Uh, so, you know, what's normally 60 to 80 percent of our generation mix was 37 percent. So how do you fill that gap? Well, coal was uh, about 52, 55 percent of what, what happened then. And so the hero of the day it was. And, and certainly, you know, we have some coal plants around the state that don't run very often because they're not the least cost. We get our coal typically from Wyoming, so there's a transportation component. Natural gas is produced right here in the state, and it's much more generally affordable. Um, so, you know, oddly, the day we we came out of the storm, it was natural gas. I mean, it was wind that wind picked up, and, and we were able to, uh, you know, 
take the, the emergency level down to, to two, which meant they weren't going to curtail power because renewables picked up. Uh, the very next day, we were teetering on the line. Renewables were at 2.5% across the grid, and diesel generation was at 3.5%. So if you think about it, that's people, businesses firing up old diesel generators, and they were actually out producing renewables. And so it's really just a big puzzle. How do you fill it? And that that's, you know, really the concern that I have going forward as we move into a bunch more renewable or even gas is – um, if we get rid of all the coal, what, what fills that gap? If we hadn't had coal, even though we don't use it very much, again, about 8% is what our mix is, how do we fill that 55% that we were missing? And I think there are so many Oklahomans that when they go to hit that light switch, you know, even at the state, we don't think, oh, you know, we know how much it costs in the end. We don't see all the decisions oh, yeah. that are made behind the closed doors. And now so many people are wondering, how do I pay for this bill and what's being negotiated and, and where is that at? So... Because, because the utilities don't have a choice of whether to provide you power or not. If they can generate and it's the health, safety, and welfare of our people, they, they have a duty and an obligation to generate. So they have to go and purchase the gas. Uh, in, this, in this case, the gas was the component that was most expensive. And <clears throat> because we saw spot markets um, to levels that have never been seen before, uh, they had to the the duty to go buy gas, so they're buying it on behalf of their customers. So, I think a lot of people misunderstood that that this is a debt of the utility when it's in fact a debt of the people who they provided that gas for. And and our statutes are set up such that, that that's an automatic pass through. Well, if if we were to pass those costs through, or the utility was to pass costs through, the average uh, Oklahoma citizen couldn't afford it. And so we had to go look for ways to make that as absolutely affordable to the citizens of Oklahoma as we could in a way that, that, that would allow them to continue to feel like their bills were affordable. And so that's what we did is we, we spread that cost out or allowed the Corporation Commission to consider a, a remedy that they wouldn't have had otherwise, and that's to bond those costs and spread them out at about 1% to 2% interest over the life of that bond versus about 12% uh, on a carry cost. So if you're talking a billion dollars, that's $120 million a year added to that versus, you know, 10,000. At the state, I think or ten million. we saw million. that magnified uh, at home. And Norman, I can say that I was blessed. I think we only went through a minor blackout. And I know for so many Oklahomans, you know, I had at the time, I think she was four months old. And all you realize is like, okay, <laughs> I'd like my house to be warm now. But I appreciate the knowledge you bring because you're right. I mean, I didn't have any idea on the back end. And now knowing you're also carrying projects from Oklahoma to D.C., what does that plan look like? So, you know, the storm came a month into a new new administration. So, uh, you know, it's all new to everybody at that point as to, to how to deal with the new administration. And, and I will tell you that, that they've certainly been uh, available to communicate with, and I've appreciated that. And it's all been Zoom, and, and but, but nonetheless, you're getting to meet with people. And, you know, in February, most of these political teams aren't in place. So you're dealing with, you know, people that are in acting positions maybe one or two political appointees. And so, um, you know, that was a really challenging, challenging time because Texas, we knew, we knew that they were going to need billions of dollars of help. Uh, our problem was about four and a half billion. And that's, you know, just in excess gas costs that, yes. that, that uh, both consumers and businesses across the state will ultimately pay. Uh, and certainly it affected our affordability uh, for the quarter. You know, that's how they measure it. And we went from, Steve knows this, we went from being number one, nine of the last uh, 11 quarters on affordability across all sectors of, of uh, commercial, residential, and industrial to 42nd. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll regain our purchase, number one, this next quarter. I'm, I'm 100% confident of that. That anomaly is going to be a fun story someday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important, though. The reason we kind of got into the weeds on the problem in February, it's super complex. Like, it's not, like, easy yeah. just to sit and pull one lever. There were a lot of – there was within state government, there was, a, like, OMS was sort of the million-dollar utility bill. The state got a $60 million-plus, and 
and Secretary Wagner and his team have been working through all of that. Um, you know, private citizens, uh, this is one of those things where you've got to have very smart people in these roles because as, as Secretary Wagner just kind of laid out, so many moving parts to it. At the same time, when he's trying to drive a, an energy plan, talking about hydrogen and other things, to continue, um, you know, keeping state uh, in the top 10 of not just ener- like renewables, but different sources of energy be op- being open to uh, different sources of energy. In your mind, Ken, what do you want to see? Like, what's your vision for, what do you want Oklahoma to be known for in the energy community? I think we want to be known as a leader in all forms of energy and 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 an environmental leader as well i think you're starting to see that it's not just hey it's renewable or this it's about how do we manage the carbon intensity of a particular energy Mm -hmm. source and you see oil companies for instance having net uh, zero pledges we would have never seen that several years ago and and we're seeing states and other governments doing net zero pledges and we want to be able to provide those energy sources that allow for that you know our 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 obligation uh, and duty to future Oklahomans, my kids, your kids, their yeah. their your our grandkids, is to uh, manage our resources in a way that that uh, ensures clean land, our beautiful water, uh, safe drinking water, and clean air to everyone. Right. And so, how do we do that while promoting one of our biggest economic drivers in in the country and that's by being diverse it's like anything else uh, we can be that solution and that's why you see uh, companies like uh, canoe and 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 certainly the the much uh, anticipated you know battle for tesla sure. uh, and other companies that are coming here because they're starting to recognize that our environmental story is one that is will stand up to any states. Are are you seeing diversity getting driven through some of the traditional energy companies where now they're looking at applying more of their research and development dollars into some of these renewables and other forms of energy? Absolutely. I think think most people need to understand that this energy transition isn't really, uh, there are certainly environmental components to all of it, Um, but it's really a consumer and investor driven revolution. Uh, consumers have spoken that they want the cleanest source of energy possible in the most sustainable way. And investors have taken notice and they have put demands on their uh, leadership at those companies, whether it's a, you know, a, a tech giant like mm-hmm. Google or Facebook or Amazon or uh, a, a traditional energy company like, uh, you know, Devon certainly here and Williams companies and, and many of the, the large oil companies that we've seen. Uh, uh, another large one that that bought Anadarko Oxy, uh, they started Oxy Low Carbon Ventures about five years ago and are planning, you know, CO2 pipelines, direct air capture, lots of really cool things. And so, I think people need to recognize that this isn't energy people getting and you know fighting it out. This is a consumer driven people uh, thing, and we want to be able to meet that demand as consumer interests change. We want to be nimble and we want to be able to say we've got that resource and we can meet it here in Oklahoma and not only can we meet it we can meet it in the most affordable and most environmentally friendly way that that's possible. Secretary Tim Gatz had brought up that there are more electronic vehicles than ever anticipated in our modern day and that was something the state didn't really see of now with canoe and everything else that's what you're saying is the consumers driving that demand. Yeah, yeah. I think I think another one of these factoids that surprises people is that uh, our our EV infrastructure so most people are surprised to learn that that as far as supercharging infrastructure, we're number one in the country per capita. So we have the most supercharging stations per capita in the country. Wow. And that and you know I, you're always jaundiced a little bit about talking about per capita and putting oh, qualifiers yeah. on on statistics. But I think it gives it a lot more depth and breadth when you realize that we're number three overall. So California, Washington State, and Oklahoma. We were talking to a family member this weekend about what their next car purchase is going to be. And they have desires to go to Pittsburgh, right? They, Oklahoma, and then Dallas. So that's a pretty long yeah. stretch of highway. But we get there's a website. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But you can go see the EV infrastructure for charging stations across all, all, all fuels. It's an app on your of phone. Of course you it's would know. Super <laughs> cool. Yeah. So if a, you go, it'll. I mean, if you didn't already know this, go check this thing out because if you if you're thinking about making the switch, 
there is a lot of infrastructure available. Well, well, Alt Alt Fuels also has CNG. Hmm. Uh, it, oh, that's right. it, it yeah. also has propane it, you, so, it, and, as well as EV infrastructure. So uh, you can plan a, literally plan a trip trip on that. But, but our network is such that, that you shouldn't be able to go 50 miles without encountering a supercharging station. Wow. And that's before all the government incentives. You yeah. know, we went out and did a public-private partnership with our VW money or the VW settlement money that uh, earmarked a maximum of 15% for EV infrastructure. And we found we took our money and uh, found somebody who who invested uh, about between 25 and 30 million. I'm told Francis Energy, uh, and then we only paid for 15 percent of each of those stations. That's amazing. And so, as a yeah. result, that's why that's, we have this robust. It's got a lot of free stuff. <laughs> and uh, and and you know, it really has differentiated. I think it played a part in why we got Canoe. Mm -hmm. Why we're you know we we also have. Uh, Spears New Technologies here, which is uh, the there other than maybe one or two OEMs, they do the refurbishment and warranty work on EV batteries for the entire um, you know automaker industry, and so that's right here in Oklahoma City. So you talk about going 50 miles in every direction. You two have been busy on the road traveling with the cabinet. What has that been like? Where have you gone? What are, What do you think? Well, it's Secretary Wagner. Yeah. So so. Uh, I guess I'm kind of, you know, Secretary Gatz, Secretary Arthur, and I and myself are the the lone uh, from the the beginning. But but the I was senior statesman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely the older older statesman. But but uh, you know, it's it's great because we get to spend time together, riding a bus together, which sounds uh, tiresome, but it, it's quite fun actually. And. Uh, except when the governor drives, and then, then it's a, then, because he talks with his hands, you know. So we got <laughs> all over the road. <laughs> but but uh, it's it's been great fun, and you get to 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 know your colleagues better, and uh, you know certainly uh, your predecessor and our friend John Budd did a good job of of really promoting the idea that Absolutely. we that we need to work together and and i know that was one of the reasons that we were so excited that you came into the role because you knew everybody you knew that dynamic already and you you've certainly worked with all of us with your position with omes um and so that's really been been seamless you know but for me um secretary uh, blaine arthur and i have to work together almost you know i don't want to say daily but it's close because so many of our, our issues overlap on mm -hmm. land and uh, and chemicals and water and and and, and air, uh, and she's just the best partner you could hope for. Uh, you know, if, if you want to face a VAG, she lives at every moment of her life and and cares so deeply, but but understands that AG needs to play a part in you know preserving our environment and and certainly her her constituents care about that as well. And so that's to me. When I think of my time in state government, it'll be about those relationships and how, you know, we were able to take those and, and really uh, hopefully empower our agencies to, you know, catch the vision and, and focus on the vision rather than, you know, necessarily the, the tedium of the job. Those trips are a lot of fun. The first one, uh, this last road trip was also the first overnight trip, yeah. I believe, right? So, so it was a slumber party. You it guys was a slumber party, party, Quartz Mountain, which, by the way, shout out to Quartz Mountain. If you unbelievable, it's it's you, incredible you, what they've done. In you think you're in the middle of Santa Fe or something like that? It's it's uh, it's cool. Um, but that being said, well, and I think um, uh, Director Jerry uh, Winchester's team was there and met us and rolled the carpet out. But those trips, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie, but at the same time, there's a lot of business that gets on those buses. Like on the way back, I got a chance, and you were in, in there with us. Uh, Ken and I rode with Secretary Walters, yeah. and I've met, as director of OMS, I hardly ever saw him. And then on that bus ride and coming back, we, we went through a multitude of issues and things um, with him, and he took feedback from me and Ken and Secretary Arthur, who's sitting right next to us. So really, I think it was the one of the best like collaborative trips to actually get some real work done at the same time uh between cabinet members that since i've been on you know yeah and it wasn't it wasn't necessarily in our issue it was like hey you've got an agency issue how how would you deal with that I'm, i've got right. some pushback on this and uh you know we yeah. were able to to collaborate and you know R R secretary walters ryan Bring such a fresh perspective, so you know he's going to hear it, this too. It was he good says for he oh, well, he's to every episode, It was it so. was good for us as well, and and uh, um, yeah, I just 
I just appreciate those things. Um, and you guys also get feedback from the people you go to talk to. I saw plenty of pictures, and I'm sure yeah. people show up because, one, they want to meet the governor, and, two, you all are bringing these bold ideas, like what you're talking about energy. I don't think most people around the corner, even in the metro, you know, in the state, know this so it's it's new ideas it is it's it's it really is almost shocking to people and it, it's right before our eyes i mean we we did it because it's the right thing and it fits our state and it fits our profile uh, but you know for us um, we we really truly can be proud as oklahomans and i start my speeches with you know i'd love to throw some facts on you that when you're when you're out there and you've got some uh, snooty a condescending <laughs> bi coastal person trying to lecture you about the environment here's some things that that they probably ought to know and, and 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 arm them with that because we don't need to hold our head or hang our head That's right um, you know natural gas has done more for emission reductions tangible measurable in- emission reduction than any other technology since removal of lead from gasoline and so now you just gotta we'll, let that sit with you that was yeah, a heavy statement yeah and so when you think about why are we why are we going to villainize something that's taken us so far? Because some of these other technologies theoretically will will re- reduce emissions at a greater rate. They haven't done it yet, mm. and they they don't have the track record that that natural gas does. And in Oklahoma, the reason we can be at fifty percent renewable and still be the most affordable state in the country is because of natural gas and the way when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, we can chase it with as low or lower cost with immediately dispatchable energy. Well, hey, look, Steve always has one big question for everyone as we tie this up, and I don't want to cut it too short. So if you have anything else... You, you know, I'm changing the question. Are you? I am, because what we used to talk about was hope, because we were coming out of a pandemic, right? We were in a pandemic when we started this podcast series and then as we were coming out it's like what gives you hope i'll ask that today but we got to switch that up because rather i mean i gotta be careful that my medical team will get all over me but it's not the same i mean the governor's been very specific about his message of hey get back to his life as usual as much as you can it's personal choice uh let's make sure people who are getting vaccinated but we're not going to shut the state down and that's going to happen we're we're not going back to Mm. last march april may june uh so that being said um but now as we're coming out of that, you know, Ken, what um, what does give you hope? What what you know, you're here to make an impact. Uh, you're doing a great job leading our energy cabinet. But what gives you hope, knowing that um, you know, when your kids, I believe also your daughter's an all-stater, right? All all shout Blair, yeah. Well, you want a little shout that. out? <laughs> hey, pr- proud Papa. Yeah. He was all over Facebook with it. Super <laughs> cool, man. Good, congratulations. Thanks. But her generation is coming, and then the next generation. What gives you hope that you know? In Oklahoma in general, or in in the in, in what you're doing with energy, that's going to make the life better for her and other Oklahomans. Well, I think it's the idea that we we in Oklahoma have always been energy pioneers, and we really want to brand that idea. And and by that, when you think about it, when you think of the titans like you know the Phillips brothers, Frank and Wait Phillips, and E. W. Marland, and uh, and and Bill Bill Skelly, their actions literally changed the course of history. They changed, they shaped our world's economy. Mm-hmm. They industrialized countries, uh, allowed for things like refrigeration of food and That's movement cool. of, 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 yeah. of goods. Then, then, you know, we brought energy abundance with people like uh, modern day titans like uh, Aubrey McClendon and T. Boone Pickens and Harold Hamm. Well, who is that next titan and what is that technology? It doesn't have to be oil and gas. And, you know, we're, we're number two or three, depending on your metric, in wind energy. We're, you know, battery, um, you know, we've got battery manufacturing here in the state. We're, we think we're going to be the hub for hydrogen in the Midwest. Uh, and uh, certainly just whatever technology is next, that's what gives me hope is that we have that pioneering spirit to react and do it in a way that benefits the entire country and world. And so uh, we see um, energy revitalizing here and we see our wonderful workforce, our best natural resources, our people, yeah. and and that we can uh, put together you know, programs that allow people to have family sustaining jobs which allows them good nutrition great education and good health care you know so it's really that balance of treating the environment stewarding our natural resources and creating opportunity for families 
I don't think I could end it any better, but I will say the one thing that I'll take away from this is just how diverse Oklahoma is and how there's so much intentional behavior that goes on behind the scenes that we take for granted every day. So for that, I want to thank you. Just want to say thank you to the cabinet's elder statesman. uh, (laughs) That's your official title. (laughs) And I hope you come back. I really do. It's uh, we do this so that we want to make sure anyone that comes on the program has the opportunity to tell the story behind they're either you know what they're active in or how they're driving either a cabinet position we've had sarah stitt here we've had others um but definitely and if there's anyone else that you want to bring next time we'd love to, to to have them on here as well one last shout out grda does a great job I, we were out um secretary wagner had his cabinet at an off-site meeting they did a great job i got to meet and talk to them that's another kind of uh, if you're in the uh, grand lake area you probably know more, more about them but they do a great job, and I think there's um, uh, more education that could that could be done there. So eventually, maybe have you and John Wise uh, Kyver come back and hang out. We'd love to. They 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 have, you know, people think they're Grand Lake and that that one dam, and 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 they they are public power. They provide power to 24 uh, municipalities uh, at the to many of our biggest, uh, you know, industrial areas yeah. uh, like Google. And uh, but but they also run the Illinois River and our Scenic Rivers Commission Mm. and they do so much environmental work that the state gets the benefit of that that is important so thanks for doing that and and to your point Bonnie I I think if people knew the amount of research and development and technology that's happening at our the companies that produce energy in this state they'd be excited about the future. Well, guys, we are going to have more um, from Secretary Wagner coming up at the State Suppliers Expo on October 19th. And it has been an absolute joy to have you here today. So please be sure to like, comment and share this so we can get some good news out about government. And we will see you next time.